Just one more thing. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. What time is it? Good afternoon. Okay. It's good to see you all. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Ready to go? Well, thank you all for being here today uh, to celebrate truly uh, a, an historic accomplishment here in Oregon. You know, often the word historic is a little overused, um, but I know for a fact that there were many people, myself included at times, who thought getting campaign contribution limits through the Oregon legislature would never happen. But here we are today to acknowledge and celebrate all the efforts that have led to House Bill 4024 in this year's legislative session, bringing Oregon into the company of 45 other states to have campaign contribution limits. Less than four years ago, Oregon voters sent a very clear message. Over 80% voted in favor of amending the Oregon Constitution to allow for campaign contribution limits in our state. <clears throat> and here we are. For many years, people in this room and a lot of folks watching today brought different valid perspectives to the table on what campaign finance reform in Oregon should look like. And I want to acknowledge that those conversations were complex and they were never easy because even in the pursuit of a common goal that the vast majority of Oregonians have supported, there were multiple possibilities of how campaign finance reform could look in our state. Because for something as important as this, the details do matter. And what I can say today is I truly believe that the bill and the new law that has been passed will strengthen transparency and confidence in Oregon's elections. I wanna thank the legislators this year who made it happen, especially a couple of our speakers today. Um, now, Speaker of the House, Julie Fahey, and House Republican, Jeff Halfrich, who worked really hard to get a bipartisan compromise done in a 35-day legislative session. I also wanna thank other legislative leaders over the years who worked on this. Senator Canope, who's here. Former Speaker Dan Rayfield, who had worked on this um, solidly over the years for their longstanding commitment to this cause because their efforts over the years also got us here today. Furthermore, I want to thank all the representatives who came and worked on this in the session from labor organizations, from business groups, from our good government advocates out there who've been working on this, uh, on this issue for years, to our nonprofit 501c4 organizations who also came to the conversation. Because everybody came together and recognized the urgency of the moment in front of us and knew that change needed to happen. So this moment today and the passage of this bill represents the best of what is possible when people with differing viewpoints, but who have a common goal, can thoughtfully come together and provide the leadership that Oregonians so want to see. So again, I'll close by saying thank you to everyone who worked on this. This is a big day to celebrate what we have accomplished going forward for Oregon's democracy and its elections. And you're going to hear from folks who have been involved in that. And I really appreciate them being in, here today. Our speakers, Speaker of the House, Julie Fahey, House Republican Leader, Jeff Helfrich. We have Kate Titus from Common Cause, Reina Lopez from Pekun, Angela Wilhelms with uh, OBI, Oregon Business and Industry. They will speak, we will sign, and we'll take some photos. So with that, Speaker Fahey, Leader Helfrich. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. For, as the governor said, for many years, 
Oregon has been one of a handful of states that don't have any limits on how much people can give to political campaigns. Instead, we relied on very strong public disclosure requirements so that voters can at least know who's writing those big checks. The last time the legislature acted to change don donation limits was about 50 years ago when we raised the cap on contributions. So today, we're here to celebrate House Bill 4024, which passed the legislature with overwhelming bipartisan support. This bill will finally meaningfully limit campaign contributions in Oregon. It will level the playing field between everyday Oregonians and the billionaires who have been pouring money into Oregon campaigns in recent years. It represents a good faith compromise in the best Oregon tradition. Everyone came to the table willing to leave their entrenched positions behind and find common ground on the best policy for Oregonians. Our goal with this bill was to meet the need for reasonable contribution limits, better transparency and accountability but without simply shifting contributions into dark money, independent expenditures, and without shutting out the grassroots organizations that are doing the kind of pro-democracy campaigning that we want to see more of, things like door-to-door -door campaigning and community organizing. To that end, we've created things like small donor committees to help engage working Oregonians who want to contribute to campaigns at a more modest level. And we've structured in contributions in a way that allows for nonprofit organizations to remain engaged, and provide the kind of grassroots organizing that's so vital to our democracy. By bringing together all these groups representing labor, business, community organization, campaign finance, legal ex experts, uh, this bill truly is a historic achievement. Um, though this bill came together in a short session, it is the result of years, if not decades, of work by advocates, campaign experts, and legislators alike, including, as the governor noted, uh, then Speaker Rayfield, who isn't able to be here with us today, but whose years of work paved the path for success this year. I also really want to thank my Chief of Staff, Scott Moore, who also couldn't be here today, um, whose patience, diligence, and persistence in staffing this work, um, not just this session, but in many previous years, are a big reason why we are standing here today. We have all witnessed the erosion of trust in our democratic institutions, and I hope that this bill and the other key measures we've passed recently will help restore some of the faith that has been lost. We're going from a system of no contribution limits to a thoughtful system of reasonable limits and transparency. That's big, it's historic, and it means that we have lots of careful years of work ahead to implement this measure. Thank you. Thanks for everybody being here. I want to say thank you to the governor for allowing uh, me to join today in this bill signing. And also I want to thank our fellow legislators who actually really worked hard to get a bipartisan uh, bill across the finish line. It's important. Um, and it's, it will bring more fairness and transparency in Oregon politics in our elections. Um, going into this short session, we had a lot of work ahead of us. We had drug and crime issues. We had housing issues. We had so many issues that were in front of us that I didn't see this coming at us at the moment when it did. And when, uh, at the time, Speaker Rayfield said, hey, uh, Leader Helprich, we're thinking about campaign finance reform. What do you think? All right, let's tackle it, see where we can get to it. It's a short session where we're at. And we were able to get some campaign, we, got, we, we were able to get do that. We were able to get Republicans and Democrats to get together uh, to seek a consensus on what we needed to have a check on the unlimited flow of money coming into our elections. And that was really important. I wanna thank uh, Speaker Fahey for her leadership and willingness to work together, to get this bill across the line. Her chief of staff, as she mentioned, Scott Moore, but also my chief of staff, Natalie Newgard. She's not able to be here, but. The behind the scenes from the leadership standpoint, our staff is really what helps keep the, the machine running and keep things going. And a lot of thanks has to go to them. Um, everyone deserves a chance to participate in our election process and it shouldn't just be for the rich and powerful. Uh, a thriving democracy depends on an active engagement of citizenry who have faith in their vote, faith in their vote that matters. Um, and that faith has been shaken uh, if people, uh, if their, voices isn't, if their voice isn't heard or drowned out by the sea of spending of rich people and, and special interest groups. And so we came together as Republicans and Democrats to get this bill across the line and help negotiate it for the best outcomes. Um, the biggest thing I wanna say is everyday Oregonians' voices have been heard and we've been able to push that bill across the line to get to campaign finance reform. We remain committed to solving some of the biggest Oregon's problems and I think this is one that we can check off that I was not looking to see that we were actually gonna do in a short session. I thought. But we'll see if we can get it across the finish line, and we did. And I want to thank 
not just only the Speaker Fahey, but at the time Speaker Rayfield, the governor, and all our staff, and all the representatives that helped get this across the finish line. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kate Titus, and I'm here on behalf of Common Cause Oregon and um, a, a, a number of good government organizations that have been working together for decades to bring us to this moment and, and hopefully beyond. I uh, thank everybody for being here. You know, the thing I want to say is that I, I think many people will say there's nothing you can really do about money in politics. It doesn't matter because there's no perfect system and those with power will always use their money to, to gain more power. And so what can you do? But I think history has shown that that's not true. That's just a rationalization. We've seen over the course of history, there are times when the influence of money in politics ebbs and flows, and it depends on what we do. And even in this current moment, we see that it, it differs around the world and around this country. There are places where we've put in place good regulations where the balance of money power to people power is very different. Uh, so it does matter what we do. The question is, can we do anything to ensure that we, what we've passed here is not everything we need. There's still work to, to be done. But it was a big leap forward for Oregon, a, a, a huge historic um, piece of progress. And I, I think there are a lot of people that deserve credit for that. Over decades, uh, Oregonians have been working for this. Um, there, there are many. I, I want to especially uh, acknowledge the political leadership that helped get this through the legislature this session. Um, Speaker, now Speaker Julie Fahey, of course, for really uh, taking the reins um, and, and doing what no other leader has been able to do um, in, in decades, reaching across the aisle um, and, and doing this in a bipartisan way. And I, I rep Helfrich for actually reaching back and working together uh, to, to pass this in a bipartisan way. Uh, Governor Kotek for nudging behind the scenes and helping this and eventually signing it. Uh, the governor's played more than one role in moving this issue forward, uh, helping to, to pass legislation out of the 2019 session on the final day of session that might have gotten killed, but that referred to the ballot, the, the measure that allowed the constitutional space to even get this done. Um, I think back to when Common Cause teamed up with then Secretary of State, uh, Kate Brown, who then be, went on to become governor, but to, to really address that constitutional issue. And there were, there were people who came forward at that time that really helped um, Jeff Lang, who's in this room today, Tom Bowerman, a team of, of campaign donors who said, we can see this buys us access when we support campaigns, and we don't want that. Um, there's also a whole movement of organizations with great leadership from Honest Elections, uh, including the League of Women Voters, Portland Ford, and many other groups, um, and grassroots groups representing people power, like Tycoon, who have, have put tremendous energy into this. I would say probably no one has put more into this than Dan Meek, um, who probably knows more about campaign finance reform than any Oregonian and has fought for it for decades. Um, so a lot of credit goes around. But I, I think we have to remind ourselves, it's not can we uh, uh, restrain money in politics, it's will we, and that fight will continue. Thanks, Kate. Hey, everyone, I'm Reina Lopez. I'm the executive director of Pecun, and wanted to just say a little bit about why we were in this fight. Um, when Pecun was founded in 1985 by 80 farm workers, we really had a dream of building our own union. And after we realized that we didn't have the legal protections to be able to do that, we had to get a little bit creative about how we built bargaining power for our farm workers. Um, and part of that work is really to build a voice for historically excluded communities. And that entailed electoral uh, organizing, which was really about bringing bilingual, bicultural voting information and recommendations to farm worker communities. Many of those who are Latino, Latine, Latinx, new citizens, first time voters who really needed a culturally competent approach to be able to vote. So we understand profoundly that the current electoral system is slanted in favor of candidates with access to traditional forms of capital. And we know that the people who can write the biggest checks often are the people who influence um, 
elections in, in many different ways. We also believe that every Oregonian has the right to know who is spending money to influence elections, and we shouldn't be subjected to endless advertising from dark money groups who intentionally obscure their identities during elections. And we all know those commercials are very annoying too, so besides that fact. So House Bill 4024 is a great example of what we can do if we can work together to significantly and sufficiently curb the role of big money in overpowering the voices of regular people in our democracy while also recognizing the important role of community-based organizations, 501c4s, shout out to all the 501c4s that also help play a role in that, in participating in elections and supporting candidates and issues on the ballot. It's also written in a way that's going to protect Oregonian voters from loopholes that could be exploited by bad actors. With reasonable limits on in-kind contributions, we can also allow our community-based organizations to continue participating in meaningful ways, even when they do not have the funds to participate in paid communications, through independent expenditures, and additionally by regula regulating staffing in-kind on uh, a, any kind of uh, participation when it comes to our electoral process. Um, it, today, we do something historic in Oregon, as you've already heard, by limiting campaign contributions, protecting the voices of trusted community organizations, working class people, people of color, and historically marginalized communities as we get closer to a government that reflects our beautiful state and is accountable to us, the people. So thank you for everybody for your great work and I'll hand it off. Okay, last, I promise. Um, I'm Angela Wilhelms, president of Oregon Business and Industry or OBI, and it's an honor to be here. As you've heard, this is a historic day. I wanna echo the thanks that have been offered um, in thanking Speaker Fahey for her leadership and her willingness to bring all parties together in pursuit of something that nobody considered possible this session. I also want to acknowledge the supportive and helpful and Im important roles played by President Wagner, leaders Lieber, Helfrich, and Knope. I also want to acknowledge the support the governor's office lent to this effort at a time when so many were simply saying no or that it couldn't be done, or that we wouldn't get it done. Your office leaned in and encouraged us to find compromise. So thank you for that leadership and in inviting us to be here today. As I've said before throughout this process and as many others have echoed, House Bill 4024 is an imperfect piece of legislation, such is often the nature of compromise. So too is the nature of campaign finance systems generally. If there were a perfect system, those 45 states we've joined would probably share that system. But they all vary. They all have nuance. They all speak to the identity of the people who help pass the systems. We believe that House Bill 4024 creates a system that is inclusive, fair, transparent, and importantly, allows candidates to maintain control, to maintain control over their own campaigns. We are most encouraged by the bill's robust expansions on Oregon's long-standing tradition of transparency in campaign finance, ensuring that voters, candidates, the media, anyone else who's interested can find what they're looking for in an easy, accessible format. We believe that our democracy is strongest when everyone has a seat at the table, when the public can easily find out who's donating what amount of money to which candidates, and when independent expenditures are appropriately disclosed and disincentivized. As was noted during the bill's passage, this is a starting point. We anticipate a discussion in 2025, maybe 2026, maybe beyond, about necessary improvements to the structure laid out in House Bill 2024. We know there will need to be a lot of rulemaking. But I hope that such work remains rooted in the compromise we've all spoke of today, it remains rooted in recognition of the value of broad participation, and it remains rooted in the continuation of a system centered on fairness and transparency. There will inevitably come a time when someone somewhere looks to manipulate what we've done in House Bill 4024 for their own political benefit, and we cannot let that happen. We have to remember the spirit of compromise that got us here today through the 2024 session and keep that in mind as we discuss any future changes. So as we celebrate today what we accomplished through this bill and the signing ceremony, 
May we also renew that commitment to those values that made this moment a reality. Thank you again, Governor Kotek, to our legislative leaders, and to our many, many partners and stakeholders who worked tirelessly in passing House Bill 4024. We look forward to working with you on the bill's implementation and in a continued spirit of collaboration. Thank you. This kind of bill, those of you who would like to be in the photo, Uh, folks tuning into the live stream, I'm gonna watch that record. I'm gonna pause the audio for photos and signing, and then we'll reconvene uh, audio for Q and A.
for my live stream. That is on. Oh, that's live. Okay. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I think we have about 15 minutes. Um, we haven't had a media availability in a while, so I appreciate you sticking around. Uh, a couple things. Um, we're still reviewing bills. Uh, no surprise. We have a whole bunch, um, I think, teed up for signing tomorrow. Um, don't ask me what they are. I'm still going, uh, looking at the list, but it's pretty lengthy. But I did want everyone to know that um, we are shooting for April 10th for any notices of possible vetoes. And I don't have any comments on what those might be, but we are required to give advance notice uh, and any possible uh, vetoes or line item vetoes or anything like that. So we're shooting for April 10th. Um, and hopefully planning to have all the bills wrapped up and signed by the 17th. There has to be uh, advance notice before we do all the final signing. So we're shooting for April 17th. So just FYI. Um, Thank you for the coverage on House Bill 4002 implementation that I've seen in the paper this week. Um, really now the hard work begins for all of our community partners. Uh, as I said in my signing letter, we have a meeting internally across the enterprise with the agencies affected, as well as local partners, uh, sheriffs, chiefs of police, counties, uh, community health providers, um, public defense, all the folks on the ground, the courts, who are going to have to move us forward here by September in the deflection that comes along with the, the new um, charge around uh, personal possession. Um, so that is moving forward. Um, what our role will be is keeping everybody on track, making sure that um, there is a uh, training coming up in May where community partners are coming together to make sure everybody's on the same page. If there's one takeaway from the signing letter. Our, we will have more success if we can have consistency and certainty in the processes at every county level as we move forward on the deflection program, um, because our goal is to have success. Our goal is to make sure people who need a pathway to recovery have a place to go instead of a jail. That's the goal. That's what legislators have put out. There's work to do. We're also uh, deep into the details of the directly allocated projects, quote unquote, the shovel ready projects on behavioral health capacity um, that we have expectations on for all of our uh, providers who will be receiving those dollars. So we're looking at that. Um, so that is a big focus here in the next couple months for our office. That is our commitment to meet the goals of the legislation uh, that we signed. Um, one other kind of minor issue, because I know it had come up in a couple places I haven't had a chance to talk to people about. The situation in the metro area regarding the uh, supportive houses, housing services measure, the SHS measure, and the dollars there. I want to say that I really appreciate what Metro Council is trying to do, which is have a clear conversation about the dollars that are needed for shelter and services that were uh, uh, the original intent of the SHS measure, but that really understanding what money has been spent and what money projected could go towards affordable housing development. I've met personally, individually with all three of the county chairs about the dollars. And my message to them is, we need to know what is sustainable for you in services and you need to show your math. So therefore, the dollars that Metro is projecting and your expenditures, we can understand what additional dollars could be available for affordable housing development. I think we all know that it's not enough to stand up shelters and shelter services and transitional housing. People need a place to go at the end of the day. And having some metro area source of funding for affordable housing development is important because the existing streams of funding are have will be expended. And so the conversation that Metro ha is having is really important. And I urge the county leaderships to really be clear about what they need going forward and understand if we have some money for affordable housing development. And then lastly, because I think many of you might have questions about this, we have had some conversations about the Office of the First Spouse and the role of the First Spouse um, in Oregon. And I think one of the things that you all know, because many of you have worked with me over the years, I take feedback. I'm always interested to know what people's questions are. Um, and we want to do this as transparently as possible. The, you know, one of the things that we inherited, we, the global we, um, there has been no guidance 
from the Oregon Government Ethics Commission on what is appropriate for the role of a first spouse since the first spouse was made a public official. So I supported that legislation when it was put into place where first spouses are now public officials under the revised statutes. That's why, you know, the first spouses have to submit, you know, their statements of economic interest, just like other electeds. But there has been no guidance on what that actually means. And we have been trying to figure that out. And I know that there are questions. So I wanted to let you all know today that we are working on a set of questions that we will submit to the Oregon Government Ethics Commission around the first spouse um, in general, like questions that I think a lot of people have. We're working on the questions. We're going to submit those, I believe, we're shooting for Friday to the commission. We'll, we'll make those public, what the questions are. The response from the Ethics Commission will also be a public document because they do give opinions and that's how they do it. So um, we hope that that will provide some clarity for everybody, certainly our office, certainly you know the public, and answer probably a lot of your questions as well. So I just wanted to let you know that. And with that, I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Governor, uh, as you consider the future shape of your staff, are you looking at either uh, finding someone uh, to implement a broad agenda you already have passed, you know, either so you've been in office or are you looking at somebody who's going to start help you start some new initiatives or both? And are you wedded to a chief of staff model? I know. I know every governor re reinvents the office, but uh, there hasn't always been a chief of staff. No, well, we'll definitely have a chief of staff. Um, you know, when I came in, um, there was some conversation even before I was sworn in about, well, how do you want the structure of the office to be governor? What should it look like? This is a, always a, anytime you have transitions like this, it's a good time to reassess. And I would say at where we are after the first year and several months into the second year, this is a good time to say, how are things working? You know, is the structure the right way? While we also look for people to step into leadership roles in the office. So I predict that we will continue to have a chief of staff. Uh, we're starting to have the conversations about the structure within the office. Do there have to be any changes based on just the, you know, point in time assessment? And then um, making sure we can make good choices to, to fill, out, fill out the rest of the staff. Um, because the priorities for my administration have not changed. It's housing, it's homelessness, it's behavioral health. It's, you know, the work of state government and it's, you know, making sure our students can be successful summer, early learning. So none of those things have changed um, and we have work to do. So, um, Hi, Nigel. Oh, can you be specific about what you expect the first lady's role to be in policy going forward and whether that will have changed after the recent staff departures? You know, I can't answer that because that's the kind of guidance we're seeking from the Ethics Commission. That's she has had an... I'm asking, will she be involved in policy and will that change? I think we are trying to figure out what that even means. What does it mean to be involved in policy? Let me give you an example. Um, because, frankly, any conversation you have as a governor is somewhat policy related. So here's a situation that we, you know, we're visiting all nine tribes um, this year as, as a sovereign nation to nation initiative to government to government relations with our tribes. So we were visiting with the uh, Confederated Tribes of Select Indians last week. First Lady, appropriately, was on the trip with me, like she was in um, many of the One Oregon Listening Tour visits. I think it's important to show the respect to show up with your family when you do these types of visits. We had a fantastic conversation about behavioral health and what the Selects are doing to deal with the issue of fentanyl in their community and some of the success they're having. So we had a great conversation. She was sitting in the room listening to the conversation. But at the end of the day, I make all the policy decisions. I was elected. I am the governor. The buck stops with me. Policy decisions and choices are mine and mine alone. I have a question, remote question, uh, from Dick Hughes. Governor, why did you not ask previously for clarification from the OJEC? And I said this, I think, uh, for some other folks last week. We weren't sure what questions we needed to ask. We are now expediting that because of the public interest. And so going to the Ethics Commission to try to figure that out, I hope we can ask all the questions we need to have answered. Um, but that was part of the conversation we were starting, which is well, what questions should we ask? What guidance do we need? Um, and so that's why we didn't do it, but we're doing it now. And hopefully we'll have something as quickly as possible from the Ethics Commission. It seems like, like you had you know, 
three of your top aides leave in part because of this role that you're going to be or in this process of taking on. I just want to know, I mean, what is the value add of this partner having this role? Why do you think it's Well, first of all, I want to get to the, the intimation you're making. Those are personnel decisions, and I have not commented on that. I know that that is the supposition. So I just, Do you want to comment on that? No, because these are personnel issues. So your other question, what we have seen, um, and I will say personally, you know, when you travel to National Governors Association meetings and you see what other first spouses are doing, we just haven't had that history in the state. We've had some active first spouses over decades. But this is the first time, going back to my opening comments, where we need to understand what it means to be a public official today under the statute for a first spouse. And for me, it's always been not about the first lady, but about the first spouse, of which there is one now. What should that role look like? We are seeking guidance from the Ethics Commission because we need some guidance because if people have lots of questions. We are, we are figuring out. I think the public's trying to understand it, and hopefully we'll get strong guidance from the Ethics Commission. Which it seems like you are creating problems for putting forward the agenda that you're talking about when in a fairly top heavy office, you now are lacking three fourths of your executive team. And we're hearing that it's because you want that increased role. So, I mean, it's just, if that's wrong, I, I, we want some clarity, Governor. Well, well first of all, um, we are continuing to work hard every day on the priorities that I have set. And we have a transition in our office where we need to, you know, have some new leaders step up. We're bringing in some new people. That is not unusual. I think the timing, we've been successful in the first year. We've gotten through a long legislative session, a successful short legislative session. There's no better time to have a conversation about transition, and that's what we're having right now. And we're going to continue to work hard on the priorities that matter to Oregonians. So I hear the concern. We're going to get guidance, and we're continuing to work hard every day on the things that are important to Oregonians. I mean, there's not, we, there's a, you can do both at the same time. So, Governor, what would you like to ideally see that look like? Well, I think trying to understand um, what a first spouse can do, um, just to be clear, she is an unpaid volunteer with both lived and professional experience on an issue that is important to Oregonians. How do you do that within ethical norms? Guidance, that's why we're seeking that from the Ethics Commission. So um, she has expertise, as many Oregonians do, but I think her professional experience and lived experience, we need to understand what, how that can be added into the mix to actually solve problems for Oregonians. That, at the end of the day, is the only issue that we're concerned about. Governor, in the funding for 4,000 internships, it seems like mm -hmm. the state is either rushing funding or it's moving too slow on funding. We saw the too slow with the burns. We've seen the too fast with recent audits on resident assistance. It seems like this latest round of funding, at least the initial within the 60 days, is the later, right? It, it's moving too fast. Counties are having to catch up. They don't even know what these programs are going to look like, but they're having to sign applications for planning grants. What if those planning grants don't work out? What if the ultimate amount of funding is not enough to build these programs? We don't know how much these programs cost. So what are you doing to make sure this actually doesn't flop and there's accountability for that money that's rushing out so on the on the money that's going out to so remember we have um, a good number of counties who have voluntarily said that they want to be part of the initial adopters of the early deflection programs related to the new bill that needs to be set up by September. We've had conversations directly with the Criminal Justice Commission, the CJC. So they are putting the first group of dollars out as planning to get started. They're going to do emergency rulemaking so we can understand the next level of funding. And I think what's really important for counties to hear from me and I've said this to the legislature in my signing letter, is we have to maintain this. We have a session next year. We have to make sure that things that the counties are going to stand up in terms of additional treatment or additional options within their criminal justice system will actually serve people, and we have to keep it going. That is the commitment. I do think the dollars that the legislature allocated for this will get us to that first point, get us through September, get us to next year, and I fully expect in next year's legislative session, we will hear from counties of like, here's what's working, here's what's not, here's where we might need more resources. Um, because this is a bit of a phasing approach here. But the goal is to be successful, and we just have to continue to adapt as, as we learn going forward. It seems forward. like you're putting a lot of trust on counties without a lot of strings attached for that initial funding. 
Well, I think it's a little bit of a, it is a little bit of a trust exercise, but what we heard from counties, the legislature heard is that counties want to do this differently, that what was work, what we had wasn't working. They want to do it differently. Um, and they're expecting um, the resources from state to be there around capacity of treatment options. Um, there will be some expectations. One of those is data tracking. We've had a really clear conversation with a whole bunch of folks. What data are we collecting from the beginning so we have a strong foundation to know if this is working? So it is a little bit of like, you know, building the airplane while you're flying it. But I don't think we had a choice, right? Oregonians wanted things to be different. Money is going to move as quickly as possible. We're going to give as much direction as possible. And we're going to keep checking on a regular basis how it's working and support the communities on the ground who are going to do the work. On 424, would this have prevented the contributions from Phil Knight to Jesse Johnson and Jim Lasso? When those limits go fully into effect, because you know we have to set it up, um, yes, it would have because there would be limits on individual contributions and more transparency if those contributions went to an independent expenditure side, there will be more transparency. Was that a motivation of this report? I do believe some of the large spending in the last gubernatorial race um, really caught everyone's attention. Um, I you know, personally don't believe we would have had as big of a three-way race if we had had contribution limits in, in 2022. What kind of boundaries do you think that you could create in, within your office to ensure that your staff feels comfortable disagreeing with your spouse and you know, if you're creating a productive, healthy workplace environment as a boss? That seems like a really difficult question. It's a, it's a really good question, right? And you want to make sure, and I want to make sure, and what the First Lady wants to make sure is we set up policies and procedures that are crystal clear for staff that if there are concerns, that there's a pathway for them to get addressed. Again, this was these were some of the questions that we were starting with. We want to do this ethically. We're trying to understand what the, what the lanes are in this type of like undefined world. And I'm hoping that the guidance we'll see from the Ethics Commission will help us out here. But you do have to provide an opportunity so people can raise concerns if they do have them. Would it be appropriate for the sponsor I don't believe the, again, going back to the first spouse as determined by the legislature and signed by governor way back when, whenever that was, um, I think it must have been Governor Brown. They're a public official. But they remain public officials for ethics. And the point you make is not mm -hmm. the same thing. I think we see in other states, it is not unusual for first spouses to have a, a public role. And so that is not an unusual thing. I, I don't believe it's apples to apples and you're talking about the spouses of directors of agencies. I, I guess I don't see the comparison. I don't know why it would even be happening. Well, well, I can't speak to that. I think you're making assumptions there. But your question about why a spouse of an agency director is they are not public officials under the law. It is a if it's, it is a different situation. So I I mean I guess I don't see that comparison. So other questions? Going back to 2002 funding, mm -hmm. the committee that's administering this funding has mentioned, for example, one of the things that they have to do because it's being rushed out is they have to decide how much more money goes to the tribes, right? Off the bat, of course, they don't have any formal information on determining how much goes to each tribe, but they had to set that floor without any data, without knowing how much tribes might need for this. And that was one of the things they brought up. They said that this has also been done in, in burn funding and that tribes got sort of last minute decided on and they got short handed. What are you doing to make a change on this issue? So I fully support allocations to the tribes. Let me just start with that. I think one of the things that has come to my attention since becoming governor is we don't have um, clarity and consistency about how tribal allocations are made. For example, remember under the opioid use uh, task force where a chunk of the opioid settlement dollars will be going to tribes as well. Um, not sure how that number was determined. My understanding from the CJC is they looked at the, the formulas that they were using um, for burn money under Measure 110 to try to set some guidance for the tribal distribution. Working with the tribes is different because once money goes to the tribes, it's a government to government relationship, it's a little different. I don't know if it's the right amount of money. We'll have to probably reassess that next year, but we have to start somewhere. 
the clear thing is we have to get started on 4002 and these changes um, on deflection. And so we might not get it 100% right on day one, but we have to get started. And the good thing is there's another legislative session here, you know, starting next year where we can reassess the money and the distribution. So good questions. I mean, we just don't know right now, but we have to get started. I was in that meeting yesterday, though. It was an arbitrary number. They didn't decide that based on any data. It wasn't based on information. They ultimately just decided to and it's a starting place. Um, and what I and probably the way that we have to do contracts with the tribes, some of that money just inherently also moves slower than when it's a state to local government. It is a much more complicated distribution of the tribes. So they the money will go to the tribes, and then we need to have a hard you know real you know clear conversation with them of like, okay, was this sufficient? Does this make sense? Um, and not every tribe, you know, every tribes are a little different. Some of them have different service areas. So there's a lot of complexity. But I am glad that they set 10% aside because it sends a message tribes are getting something and we'll figure out if that's enough and we'll be back next year to figure out how that should actually be okay, going forward. Yeah. 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 Clarification, you're expecting to send a question to OGEC on Friday, on Friday, but you've also have this new advisor who's been hired around the same question. And I'm just trying to get clarification of would not, was that questions that you had posed or questions that would be, um, Kind of answered from this advisor and i'm just trying to get a better sense of kind of the process to hire someone ahead of submitting questions like that okay. well given the timing of where we are we had the opportunity to um have a staff on loan to help us figure out what some of the questions should be and um and then the first lady also is does you know does have some public roles right now so also supporting her so we're, again, we're all free, we're figuring this out as we go. The ethics commission will just give us guidance, which we need to have. So I think it might make more sense once you see the questions, if you have any follow up, but you know, we'll have those questions out on. on time. Uh, Governor, what's your, um, what are some of the specific deadlines or ways to get shovel ready projects tied to how fiscal the year of DOT up to an era? Do you so, have any specific deadlines, for example? Um, well, currently, um, we have been very clear with the Oregon Health Authority that the money that it's currently, they have some money from um, from the biennium that's unrelated to the new money that they are they they are trying to get out the door. So they're doing the due diligence there. Um, we are examining all the, the specific projects that were in the bill from the session, seeing if they match up, because there was some overlap. So we're trying to figure that out. And then we, We'll specifically be working with every community and every recipient to say, where's your timeline? Where are you in terms of being up and running? It's what you, we have to kind of think, put on a big spreadsheet and understand how this all interacts. Uh, interacts. Remember, we're also getting the final uh, recommendation from the capacity study with the regional approach, which will be overlaid on that. And then one of the things that I think is even in the Oregonian today, I've been very clear with my staff, our workforce initiatives around behavioral health have to be completely aligned with what we're doing on raising capacity. It is not good enough to put a new brick and mortar place in some community and have it unstaffed. That's not access. So we're we're walking with some new, we're trying to put some workforce initiatives in place while we're building capacity. So when capacity, physical capacity is ready, there's actually staff for that. So we could maybe um, give us a little more time because we're, you know, the session ended, we're still looking through all the lists, but we can maybe do a specific briefing on what we think is happening there. Um, and line up all those investments so people can get a sense of where we're going. We're Final question for Carlos. Hi, Governor. Um, why did you order an increase of security protection for your wife? And do you have an idea of what that's going to look like and how much that's going to cost and how many hours it's going to take? So one clarification on that, just the, and I'm, I'm going to be high level on this because these are security issues. It is the policy of the state to keep members of the first family safe, period, plain and simple. Um, and it is commonplace in other states that first spouses have security protection. And I, I will just leave it at that because I, I feel getting more information wouldn't be appropriate. So, okay. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Really appreciate the time.